This morning we continue in our series on the book of Mark. We're in Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13 as we'll look at the first 23 verses as we get ready to see what the end looks like. This is a two-part uh, series as we'll look at what it looks like when he's coming and then we will see next week the signs of him coming and it I mean there is a lot to unpack this morning and next week but one thing that we have seen over and over and over again in this uh, study is that Jesus came to be a servant he didn't come as a ruler or as a king or as someone who was coming in authority to rule and press his uh, finger down upon the people. He came to uplift. He came to encourage. And he came to strengthen people. While it's difficult for some to deal with, the teachings of Jesus are always timely. God allows us to always hear from Him at just the right time. We're now within a few days of Him entering uh, the temple and entering into Jerusalem and Him being betrayed and turned over. And so He gives His disciples these final warnings here in Mark chapter 13, and the whole chapter is nothing but talking about the end times. Because there will come a time when this world will cease to exist. There will be a time when Christ will return in bodily form and He will gather those who have put their faith and trust in Him who are still alive and He will take us to heaven. Corinthians and Thessalonians lets us know that those who have died in the faith will be resurrected first and then us that remain will be caught up to meet Him in the air. And what a glad day of rejoicing that will be. But as much fun as we will be having in heaven, for those that are left behind, for those that have not accepted Christ as their Savior, there will not be fun. There will not be games and joy and fellowship. There will be a time of total torment and agony and destruction as God's wrath is poured out upon the people of this world because of the sins of the people. So if you got your Bibles, let's turn to Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. And as he came out of the temple, remember he had just been, uh, he just been questioned, he just saw the widow gives all that she had and he's coming out of the temple and his disciples said to him look teacher what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings and Jesus said to him do you see these great buildings there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down and as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? So they asked him a question. They wanted to know when is the beginning of the end? It's a question that has been asked since Christ returned to heaven. When will the end come? He says that this generation will see it. 
But that generation is dead and gone. So is he even coming back? And a lot of people will tell you that you don't have to worry about what is going to come because this is our heaven. Or after we die, that will be heaven because this is hell here on earth. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there is a literal place called hell. And in that place of hell is total darkness, weeping, gnashing of teeth, a burning fire that never is quenched. In the Gospels, there's a story of a man, of a rich man who had died. And there was a poor man who would sit at his gate and beg for bread, and he died. And the rich man looked up from hell and asked Jesus to send the poor man to just dip his finger in water and touch his tongue so that he could be relieved of the torment. And Jesus said, it's impossible because there is a large gulf, a large expanse that separates us. And he can't go there and you can't come here. When you die, that's the end of the story. There is no holding ground. There is no place for you to see how well your works work out or what you can do. When you die, there is one of two places that you will go. Heaven or hell, and that's it. There was so much torment and agony there in hell that the rich man said, well, would you send him back to my family so that they don't have to come here? And Jesus said, you had all of the prophets. And if you don't believe them, you won't believe him coming back from the dead. You had me and you don't believe. See, when it's when you've been to hell, you don't want anyone else to go there. It's not like the one song says that we'll have a rowdy party with all my friends when we get to hell. There is no party. There is no fun. There is no games. And if we know this as believers, and we know that there really is a place of eternal torment for those who haven't accepted Christ, then we as believers should not wait until they're dead to want help for them. We should be taking the message to them now while they are still alive and still have a chance to make that decision. Here we see in the text that as they walked out of the temple, the disciples were amazed at this temple and were talking about the stones. There's a reason for that because the temple was massive. It represented 46 years of planning and construction. Even the exterior was covered in gold to appear shimmering and glorious. Me and Cherie watched a video a few weeks ago of uh, luxurious uh, vacation destinations and what and unique and uh, one of them was extremely unique. It sits in the middle of the desert, and it, the whole exterior is made of glass, and it reflects the light so much that if you're standing in just the right spot, you don't see it. And I mean, that would be amazing and to see. And it was cool to us just watching on film as they went around. And I mean, it just literally disappears from sight. But this was made with gold. It wasn't disappearing from sight. It was blinding in its brilliance. Because the temple represented where God dwelt. And so the foundations of the stones were covered in gold. They were incredible in size as well. They measured 40 feet long 
by 12 feet high and 18 feet wide and were made of pure white and glistened in the sunlight. There are still areas around the Temple Mount where these stones fell. You can still see some of the stones. That's how we know the exact size of them. But there are some where they fell that all that is left is a huge crater from when the stone fell. That almost 2,000 years later, they are still present holes. These aren't just little rocks that you put together. They're not like the bricks on the building. These are massive stones. Just the courtyard, not the temple itself, but the courtyard that completely surrounded was more than four and a half football fields long. In Jerusalem, the temple complex was about a sixth of the size of the entire city. So rather than enjoying its completion, its size, its glory, its beauty, Jesus said, I'm telling you that this temple will fall. And we know in history, in 70 A.D., that's exactly what happened. Jerusalem was laid to waste by the emperor Titus, and not a stone was left standing. Not one stone left on top of each other. When Jesus says something's going to happen, it happens. And it happens exactly how it says there are hundreds and thousands of people that say, well, this is what's going to happen when God comes back. Or this is the year that it comes back, as we'll see next week. But let me assure you, you don't have to go to those books. You don't have to listen to anyone else. Look at what the Bible says. And what does God say is going to happen? Verse 3 we see the inner circle ask, when is the end coming? Every Christian has asked that question. When is the beginning of the end? When will it take place? And we think on these things and we contemplate these things. But Jesus gives us an answer, but not what we expected. Because it reflects the mind of God. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, the prophet says these words of God Himself, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. The people of Jerusalem that were following Jesus believed that He was coming as a king and He was going to overthrow the Roman power. But that's not what he was coming for. But let me be clear, when he comes back the second time, he's not coming as the humble servant that we saw the first time. He's coming as a conquering king in every nation, in every tribe, and every tongue will have no choice but to bow before the very knee of Jesus Christ and will bow at His feet and cry out, You are the Lord. But let me ask you this. Do you want to be forced to bow? Or would you rather willingly bow before the King? One thing that Jesus gives us in this is that it will get worse before it gets better. Look at verses 5 through 8 of our text. And Jesus said to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am He. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, 
Do not be alarmed. For nation will rise against nation. And kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. This is just the start. So get ready. That was the whole purpose of Jesus coming and showing us how to live. is so that while we are on this earth, we are ready for something more. Because how many of you know, just as I know, that once you accepted Christ as your Savior, that wasn't the end of the story for you. It wasn't a bed of roses. It's something that we have to go through and endure. And there is persecution and there are trials and there's testings. Jesus begins by giving the disciples the command to be ready to prepare. And He gives us instructions of what to look for so that we're not confused. Because that's the greatest thing about our Savior is that He is not of confusion. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 tells us that for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. In the midst of how bad our world gets, we can be in peace because we know that God is still on His throne. He has not, He will not, and He will never relinquish control. Every four years we elect a new governor, we elect new presidents, and we're used to that. In England, they're facing something that most people have never seen in their lifetime. The changing of power. But even kings and queens will relinquish control. But God is always on His throne. He never changes. Jesus warns again and again that we know what we need to know to avoid deception. It's a command to be aware. It's the same command that later He will give His disciples when they're gathered here in the Garden of Gethsemane that is part of the Mount of Olives. As He says, Stay awake while I pray. Be on guard. It's not the life of someone who is lazy that succeeds, but one who is prepared that succeeds. And we don't have to worry about failing because God gives us the tools and the information that we need to know when the time is near. Jesus gives an indication of things that are non-signs that are going to happen. The first is that people will pro proclaim that they are Jesus reincarnated. We saw this back in the late 90's with David Koresh of the Waco compound. He preached that he was the Messiah and that he was here to save the people. But yet he wore glasses. Very thick glasses. So Jesus reincarnated can't see well. Then you have Jim Jones. It's another example of someone claiming to have the word from God and 800 plus people lost their lives following his teachings and drank the Kool-Aid. And there are constantly people that are claiming to know the way. I don't know if you remember, but several years ago there were a group of people that had a little capsule that, out in the desert. And they put foil on their heads and they wrapped themselves up in aluminum suits. And 
they took a pill and went to sleep so that God will beam the light down and just transport them to heaven. Thankfully, it was only 16 people that died, but that was 16 too many. People will say whatever they want to say. But if it, their life doesn't match up with what the Word of God says, do not believe them. Whether they're just a regular person or a preacher or a politician or a ruler, if they don't match what the Word says, they're teaching something false. Why does this happen? Because people are searching for answers and hope. But as we just say, Jesus Christ is our only hope to make it. He's the only one that can provide such hope to anyone. The concept of war and nations fighting against each other is nothing new. We have seen this our entire lives. We have seen and heard of wars ever since we were born. And the United States has been in some type of conflict in the Middle East since January of 1991. And this war, this world has been at war all the way back to a documented historical piece of parchment that shows that there was a war in the early 1400s B.C. So 1,400 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, this war, this world has been at war. And it's not stopped since. So just because you hear that there's a war going on, that doesn't mean that we rush out thinking that Christ is, He's about to step foot on this earth any time now. That's not what that means. That just means that we're getting to the point of this. Because I want you to see what it says at the end of Mark chapter 13 verse 8. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. The beginning. And any woman who knows about childbirth knows that at the beginning of your labor pains, that does not mean pack the bags, let's get to the hospital, this baby's coming out. That just means you're about to excruciate, be in some excruciating pain for some period of time before it's even time for you to deliver a baby. You have labor pains before the water breaks. And the baby can't come out if the water hadn't broke. And as much as we want for him to be back right now, the water has not broken. We're just in the beginning of the labor pains. But that means that it's going to get a lot worse before He comes back. That phrase, the beginning of birth pains, invokes everything that it suggests. Jesus wants us to be prepared to know that times will be turbulent. As my dad says, we're going uphill on a bumpy road and there's construction both ways. There will not be an easy way out as so many people want to find. Because Jesus Himself told us in John chapter 16, verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in Me you may have peace. Again, He's giving us peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. There's going to be these birthing pains. You're going to have to go through some of them. It's not going to be pleasant. It's going to be tedious. You're going to want to give up. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So in the midst 
of these pains and in the midst of all of this turmoil going on, we can have peace because God has overcome the world. We can take peace because, as that old cathedral song says, I've read the back of the book and we win. We can take comfort knowing that God has prevailed. That God will save. That God is still and will always be on the throne. Do not be deceived. Many more things will come. We need to get ready. But there's also more for us to do. Look at verses 9 through 13. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And in the gospel must be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious before, uh, beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak of the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child, and the children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus is telling us here in these verses, do not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged. Jesus prepares us always for the time ahead with encouragement. He will be with us. He will keep us. He will protect us. The promise in verses 12 and 13 is that we will suffer because of the hatred of Jesus. The Romans declare that any non follower of Caesar was to be eliminated and that they were considered treasonous if they spoke out against him or the government. We're getting closer and closer to that being the case here in America. Where you have a coach that is fired from his job Because he refuses to stop praying on the field after the game. Thankfully, the Supreme Court said, no, he has the right to do so. When the world has come to an end as we know it because of... Roe versus Wade being turned back to the states. And you have people that are in fear of where our country may go because of this horrendous decision. But if you speak out, you're a bigot. And you are declaring hate speech among some. This week, on the preschool TV cartoon, Peppa Pig, a homosexual lesbian couple was introduced, showing that it's okay. Our preschool, kindergarten, and first grade kids are being taught that it's okay And one of the designated textbooks for them to read in class is, I have two mommies, I have two daddies, and that's okay. It's okay for them to bring in drag queens in costume for child read day. And they read to the kids, and they teach them 
how to dance, and this is okay. And if we say anything against that, we are the ones who are wrong. We are the ones who are hunted down. We are the ones that can lose jobs. We've seen it in the past where owners of businesses were sued and shut down because they stood on Christian values and didn't want to do floral arrangements or bake a cake for a same-sex marriage and they were called homophobes. You have people that their own family turns against them because they want to follow Christ instead of anything else. And this isn't talking about other religions. This is here in America. When you're one of those people because you believe what the Bible says, church, it's not off in the future that these things are going to happen. It is right here, right now, on September 11th, 2022, that this is going on. The birthing pains have begun. But don't be discouraged. It's going to get worse. But don't be discouraged because God is with us. God will give us what to say. And just because we are His, don't think it's not going to get bad for us. The cause of Christ is not for the weak. Jesus showed this in His own death. I somehow missed that verse. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 14 says that just as they were uh, many who were appalled at Him, His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and His form marred beyond human likeness. Jesus went through so much torture, so much pain that Isaiah 52 14 tells us exactly what He looked like. If you've seen the Passion of the Christ and you saw Jesus hanging on the cross, that is nothing compared to what He actually looked like. On the beating scene, they had to cut out six minutes of the beating just to get an R rating instead of an NC-17 because it was so gruesome. That's why there were times that He cut away because He said no human being could possibly look upon this without having nightmares for the rest of their life. He endured that suffering. And you and I will endure suffering as well. That's why He said in verse 14, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Genuine faith. That's why I missed it. Genuine faith is a real thing. Somebody has to wait on it. We must follow Him. There is a reason for that. Because the gospel must go out. Said that until every tongue and nation has heard the gospel. That's why we are given the great commission in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And then just so you don't get too worried. Remember He said, be ready. There's the ready part. But then He says, do not be discouraged because He says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. You're going to have to do this, but don't give up. I am right there with you. Amen. I am right there. Jesus promises the Holy Spirit will instruct us in what we need to say. All we have to do is obey. 
Peter showed this in Acts chapter 2 and 3 and 4. And you remember, after the day of Pentecost, they were at the temple and they met the lame man and he was begging. And he said, do you have anything that you could help me with? And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the Scripture says he went walking and leaping and praising God. And then the leaders of the church came in and took hold of Peter and John and drug them before him and said, why are you doing this? What name are you doing this? And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ and you crucified. Hmm, that's pretty bold. And they told him, don't ever mention that name again. Out they go. Praising God and preaching some more. And they go back home to the other disciples and they worship and they celebrate that they were counted worthy to be persecuted for the cause of Christ. And then the very next chapter, they get drug in again so did we not tell you not to speak of this name? And Peter said, the same one that denied Jesus three times, the same one that said, I would die for you, the same one that walked on the water, took his eyes off and sank, that same Peter just threw his mouth open and said, we mean no disrespect, but we cannot help but talk about what we have seen and heard Jesus Christ in. We saw it last week in the message in Jeremiah where it said that if I don't open my mouth and share the Word, it burns within my heart. I can't help but tell. That should be our case here because we know what the end is going to look like. We must be telling people that there is no other hope but Jesus Christ. He tells us that the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And Revelation says the one who endures to the end will receive a crown of righteousness. Mark chapter 13, verses 14 through 23 as we get to the conclusion this morning. 14 through 23. You thought it was bad. I told you it gets worse. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back and take his cloak. And alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not happen in the winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved but for the sake of the elect whom He chose He shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there He is, do not believe Him. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard, I have told you all these things beforehand. Simply put, you can run, but you can't hide. Doesn't matter who you are. You can run, but you can't hide what's coming. Several years ago when we went through the book of Revelation, we saw this promise to the believers 
Many people wonder what the abomination of desolation is. In 167 B.C., a Greek ruler by the name of Antichius Epiphanes set up an altar to Zeus over the altar of burnt offerings in the Jewish temple. He also sacrificed a pig on the altar, defiling the temple and the altar, as pigs are unclean to the Jews. Bible prophecy says that the Antichrist will perform this very same act. He orders that sacrifices are made to his image. Not only will he sacrifice a pig on the altar that the sins of the people were taken place in, we know that the servant king rides in on the back of a donkey, just as in a few weeks we'll see Jesus do as he rides into Jerusalem. This one rode the pig into the temple up to the altar and slit his throat as the blood ran all over the altar, desecrating it for all time. And then set himself up as the God of the Jews. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. We are informed that the man of lawlessness who is the Antichrist will set himself up in God's temple and proclaim himself to be God. That's what he says. Who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. So it happened before. It will happen again. It's a fulfillment of what Daniel said. In Daniel chapter 11 verse 31 it says, forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and the fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. It's prophesied all through Scripture that this will take place. And if you've noticed anything in Scripture, if it's mentioned once, it happens. If it's mentioned twice, you can bet your bottom dollar it's going to happen. If it's mentioned three or more times, you know for a certain that God will accomplish it. It's written in Isaiah. It's written in Daniel. It's written in Ezekiel. It's written in Jeremiah. It's prophesied here with Jesus talking about it. Then it's mentioned in Thessalonians. It's mentioned in Corinthians. It's talked about in Revelation. That's about ten different places that it's mentioned. You can bet your bottom dollar that God will accomplish what He says. And if He's going to bring a destruction upon the face of the earth so severe that no one could survive if He didn't cut it short, you bet it's not going to be pretty. And for those who do not know Christ, it's going to be worse because they will endure all of the brunt of God's wrath being poured out upon the face of the earth. Where Jesus is telling this story and talking to His disciples, it says that He was on the Mount of Olives. Between the Mount of Olives and the temple is a valley. The Valley of Megiddo where the Battle of Armageddon will take place. Where finally Jesus will defeat for all time Satan and his demons. It will be such a battle that no one has ever seen before. Imagine the worst fights, the worst wrestling matches, the worst boxing matches that you have ever seen. And all of that pales in comparison to this. There will be so much loss of life, so much bloodshed, that Revelation says that the blood flows to the bit of the horse's mouth. 
That's a lot of work. But here's the best part of that. We as believers just get to have a picnic on the sidelines and watch. Because while all of Satan and his demons are attacking, Jesus defeats them all by himself. And if we have a God who can do that and defeat all of the enemies and the forces and the powers of Satan and all of his demons, and Jesus himself defeats them by himself according to what the Word of God says, then when he tells us, do not be discouraged, have peace, I am with you always, I think that stands to let us know that we can have peace because we serve a king who is conquering over everything. But that should also propel us to want to tell others that there is a hope for your life. And as bad as your life may seem right now, as horrible as things may be going for you right now, you can rest assured that you have someone who is in your corner who loves you. You have someone who is fighting for you. You have someone who loves you so much they didn't want you to have to go through that alone. That He came to this earth. He died on a cross for you so that you can live with the hope and the peace and the trust and the faith knowing that Jesus loves you. Amen. That Jesus wants you. That Jesus has a plan and a purpose for you. And He wants you on the sidelines watching as He defeats the enemy Hallelujah. once and for all. Hallelujah. Amen. Ooh. Somebody got a little bit excited there. Jesus tells them that when this happens, flee immediately. Amen. When this desolation comes and it hasn't come yet, get it out of Dodge. It says if you're on the rooftop, don't go back into the house and gather your possessions. Just go. If you're in the field, don't look back. Go. Just go. And it's not, let's just walk and take a peaceful time. He says, run and get out of there. There won't be time to gather a cloak for added food. And as horrible as it is, Jesus tells us that it will be even worse if it happens in the winter. Some may wonder, well, why would that be? Think about winter. It's cold. Their summers are about like our summers. Dry and hot. And humid because they're up there by the ocean. Their winters are bitterly cold. One other reason why we know that Jesus wasn't born in the winter, but that's for another thing. Verses 20 through 23 shows us a shift in Jesus' teaching, which is so vital to us today. It shows us the end times and of the catastrophe that will come upon all humanity. For the sake of the elect, those who have been saved and set apart by God, a reference to the people of God, we will face persecution and trial too. Remember, this is the beginning of the birthing pains. Christ hasn't come yet. The rapture hasn't taken place yet. We will endure and see and experience the power and the wrath of God like never before. And while some people say that some of these hurricanes and wildfires and earthquakes are God's punishment for the sins of people, it may be a wake-up call 
but it's not the wrath of God. When God pours His wrath out, no one will be able to say it. Thankfully, as a believer, we have God's mercy and forgiveness to save us and to protect us. And we'll find His mercy. So do not believe the rumors of things that might be or could possibly be in the works. It shows us here that even God's people can be deceived. Because things sound really good. And people, and unfortunately especially preachers, have found ways to twist God's word to make it say whatever they want it to say. And we read earlier where it says that don't worry about what to say that God will give you the words to say when you're draw, taken before court. That doesn't mean you go out and you rob and you steal or you kill somebody. Don't worry about going to court because God will give you the words and you'll be free. That's not what that is saying. When you are brought before the court because of your faith in Jesus Christ, God will give you the words to say. God will protect you. That's what that is referring to. When, but we can twist it to say whatever we want it to say. People have said that there are number codes throughout the Bible and it gives us the exact date when Jesus will return. We'll see next week that Jesus in this passage says, even I don't know when I'm coming back. And if you can pick a date and a time and a place, well, we know the place because it says he'll return to the Mount of Olives, but if you can pick a time and a date, you're better than Jesus Christ. No wonder he said, don't stick around, run. Because if you're bigger and more powerful than Jesus, I don't want to be around you. Because we just saw how powerful our God is. And I've always said that if somebody did just perhaps pick the date and time, he'll be late. Jesus will show up late just because they think. But he says in Corinthians, he comes as a thief in the night. He's going to come when we least expect him. Which means, if he's coming when we least expect it, we need to be ready at all times. Because before we walk out this door, he could return. Before you wake up in the morning, he could return. Before you wake up in the morning, you could be in the presence of God. Because your life ended on this earth. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised this afternoon. So we need to make sure that we know that we know that we know that we are His. Not only do we need to make sure that we know that we know that we know that we are His, but we need to make sure that we know that we're telling others who He is. Because how much do we have to hate somebody to want them to endure this punishment that is going to come without God on their side? He's given us all the information that we need. He has told us everything ahead of time so that we will know. We don't need to look for any other answers than what God has already given to us in His Holy Word. We are to look to Him, to live for Him, to exalt and honor Him. When we come in and sing praises, when we come to church... One of the things that we say about our church is it is a training ground for the believers. It's one of the best things that the military ever did is have a boot camp when you go in. You don't raise your hand and pledge to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies foreign and domestic. Here's you a gun. 
Go fight. I've never shot a gun in my life. What am I supposed to do with it? Which end do I shoot from? How do I load this thing? If it jams, what do I do? No, you sit there and you learn how to break down that weapon. How to clean it. How to shoot it. How to put it back together. And if it ain't fast enough, you tear it down and build it back again. And it better be clean. And when you're coming off the firing range, there better not be any rounds left in that chamber. Two reasons. One, for safety. But the number, the main reason, there's no reason not to use all of your ammo against the enemy. We have a loaded weapon right here for the enemy. We need to know how to use it from Genesis to Revelation because the whole Bible tells the story of God's redemption of mankind. Genesis 1 and 2 are great. That's the best chapters in the Bible because all is well with the world. In Revelation 22, all is well with the world. But the rest of the Bible, 66 books, are all about God saving man from himself. And if we're not saved, we will spend eternity in a fiery pit called hell. Blandon was doing his devotions this week in class. One of the things that we've been looking at in this study is fear. And there are 365 verses in the Bible that say, do not be afraid. Fear not. Don't fear. Any of those combinations. 365 of them. Just curious. How many days of, uh, How many days are in a year? Okay, so there's 365 and there's a ver 365 verses that say do not fear. You realize that's a verse a day that God is drilling into us you don't have to be afraid. I am with you. No matter what the world throws at you, I am with you. Amen. And Romans 5, 8 tells us that if God be for us, who can be against us? And I love how the message puts it. If God is on our side, who can be stupid enough to be against us? We know who is stupid enough to be against us. Because he's always been jealous of God. And he sinned in heaven thinking that he could be God himself. Made Adam and Eve fall because he tricked their, them into thinking that God was holding something back. And he was. He was holding evil back. Because everything was good. They had no concept of that. And yet we traded it for a lie. And we've constantly been pushing a lying agenda since. When we try to say that we don't need God in our lives. You can't take a breath without God. You can't blink without God. You can't get up without God. It's not the easiest thing trying to get up with crutches. It's not easy trying to get up when you barely can put weight on your feet because they hurt. When your legs don't support you. 
when your head is about to explode. When your back feels like it's about to break. When you're dizzy because your blood sugar or blood pressure is out of whack. When you don't know what's going on, it's difficult to be able to do anything. And it can be scary. But we have a God who is there with us. Who gets us up. Who gives us the strength to endure. We must be ready. We must be on guard. We must not give up and be discouraged. And we must not run away from Him when things go bad. My friends, that's when we need to run into Him. And unfortunately, that's the problem that we have in our world. Because instead of running to God when things go bad, and running to the church, people run away from the church of God. That's not how it should be. Right. Because He's our only hope. And if He's our only hope, He's their only hope as well. So this week, as we go through our every day. Are you showing them your hope? Are you showing them that you know the answer to the problem of this world? And are you showing them by your life that you know who your hope is. God, we thank you. That you give us your peace, your strength. May we not turn back from you. When the going gets tough, may we run to you and follow you even closer. For you have overcome this world. You have given us your peace. Remind us daily not to get discouraged and run away from you. May we find strengthen our faith and not in fear. Thank you that we don't have to live not knowing where our future will be. That if we would just call on you, ask you to forgive us, to save us, and to be the master of our lives, your word says that you are faithful and just to hear us, to forgive us, and to save us. And we can live with you forever. May we have a heart and a love for others that we would tell them about the only hope for their lives. It's not found in any self-help book or palm reading or psychic, but only in the blood that you shed upon the cross. Thank you for your cross. Thank you for the hope that you have given to us. And it's in your name we pray these things. The altar is open if you need prayer. This is your time. Make sure before you leave today that you know, that you know, that you know that He is Lord of your life. But also, before you leave, 
make sure that you know that you're telling others.